<laughs> I should have answered. Uh, I got about uh, Sounds like 25 <laughs> minutes. Although I have to admit, if, if in the spectrum of scientific realists and a realist view, where would our current president land? <laughs> scientific nihilism? <laughs> but boy, we got a lot. Um, I don't know yet. Yeah, I don't know where I should start there. Why don't we go with Eric and then, and then I'll help her out. Oh, right. And then uh, I'll, yeah, and then I'll. So I would write this, Kyle. I was so hopeful. I was so hopeful that, that you were going to prove Howard wrong. Because, you know, I, I, I guess I've been trying to do it for 20 years. I, 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 don't, I don't think you did. Uh, because, um, so, first, uh, so, okay, a few things to say. First of all, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right to focus on the point about the, uh, uh, the, the passage of the forms, the persistence of the forms. But I think you might be reading it, if I understood you, I think you might be reading it a little too literally or a little too, uh, in too constrained of a fashion. I, I, I take Howard to be saying there not that we should hold on to Lagrangian uh, dynamics, and it's always going to be Lagrangian dynamics, but rather that whatever does develop in the future, um, it, it will have a responsibility to show why today Lagrangian dynamics was so successful. It itself doesn't have to be Lagrangian dynamics. It doesn't have to, have to look very much like Lagrangian dynamics. It just has to be able to, to, to explain why today, in our current state of knowledge, Lagrangian dynamics was so successful, and presumably that will mean that there's something in that structure that in some appropriate sense one can kind of see the shape of Lagrangian dynamics and are reduced down to it or something like that. But, but and, and I think that, I mean, to me, what you're, the, the, the picture you're painting of what you want to call the, a sophisticated realist, I mean, I actually see, see that as a kind of bumpkin realist. Because <laughs> it's, uh, the, the, point, the point isn't that, that we know now which of the principles are important to hold on to. Um, and I think that this is, in fact, exactly the, the, uh, so beautif beautifully, it's not beautifully, so uh, poignantly, uh, instantiated in the in current contemporary uh, theoretical physics, because if you look at you know, quantum, you had search for quantum gravity, you see the entire field of, of theoretical physicists who uh, the, and, uh, that with, with just enormously varying opinions on which which of the principles in general relativity and quantum field theory and thermodynamics to hold on to and which not to hold on to in their search for current projects, and they they obviously all disagree with each other. But none of them thinks, I, well, some of them do, but put those aside. Uh, most of them don't think the other ones are crazy for thinking it's that principle and not that principle. It's, but, but you know, they, they think there are, there are good arguments to be had. M most of them think there are good arguments to be had for, the, for which principles to hold on to and drive the search. Mm -hmm. And the, that's the kind of good realist attitude. Yeah, so, some principles we need to hold on to in our search, but which ones exactly, it, 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 it's a very I think it'd be a very naive realist right, to say, I know given our current knowledge, which are the important ones? Well, so uh, there's a couple things to say. One is uh, looking at contemporary theoretical physics is always a little bit tough in connecting up with the big global realism uh, debate because in theoretical physics, it's so frequent to find it the same. But nobody could think that, right? It would be ridiculous to think that we can pick out and advance the things that are going to say, right? Um, that is what scientific realists, as traditionally construed, think. Uh, I'm sorry? For example? Scientific realists? Yeah, as, uh, yeah, yeah. Think so. <laughs> Who well, thinks we that? We tend to be a paradigmatic scientific realist. Uh, well, I take it that all of the selective realists think that, because they say it explicitly. Who? What? All the selective Silos. realists. Kitcher, uh, Silos. Putnam? Putnam's hard to call. <laughs> Putnam's hard to call. Uh, but I think so. I mean, look, if you right, just think about the, the, the famous claim, right? The only explanation for the success of science uh, that doesn't make it a miracle is that the terms refer and that the, um, that the theories were constantly true. Uh, the, but, so, no, I guess that leaves open the same kind of ambiguity that, that's here, right? But, and so, look, it seems to me that in characterizing how Howard is thinking about it, uh, I think what you say is, is, is just right, that what he's, he doesn't think we can pick and choose, uh, but that uh, we will have this kind of retrospective uh, understanding of the, the sorts of continuities that did wind up persisting. But that's why I say the thing about, uh, th that's why I ask whether that's really preserving anything of the realist impulse in the first place, right? If so, so you can think of it in, in two different ways, right? If, right, all we're committed to is look, looking back, we'll be able to see some pattern of structural continuities, and it'll be 
a deepening, um, right? I don't think what, uh, nobody ever did not, mm, not nobody. <laughs> very few instrumentalists, certainly very few instrumentalists motivated by the historical record, ever denied anything like that, right? What they really think is, right, sure, we'll look back, there'll be some pattern like that, but we don't have any idea what it is. And if Howard also thinks, right now, we don't have any idea what it'll be, I think he's just made himself an instrumentalist. If he does think we know some things about what it's actually going to be, well, then he's preserving some part of realism, but that ought to make a difference to how well, in, in a sense, my question has already been answered because Great. I, I, I felt that I was a, a realist who was happy with the merely retrospective indication of the, the realist success of the previous science. But surely, I mean, rather than focusing on which realists have said we need more, surely it's clear that some instrumentalists have denied that we've got even that. I mean, Loudon's examples, the way Loudon mm. pitched it, the idea is that you cannot explain these past successes in realist terms. And if you're saying, well, from a, with hindsight we can say, okay, they got what's wrong, but they at least got something right, and that's, and it's their getting that right that explains their success. That's, that's not uh, instrumentalism. I mean, that's realism in, in Malcolm's terms. So, uh, I mean, I think realism's become fairly denuded if what it amounts to is previous theoretical uh, commitments were not completely wrong. I think that's rubbed it down pretty far. <laughs> but uh, I want to agree, I think, with the, the glo more global point you're making. Uh, and the, the mistake I made, and it, it was a mistake in, in saying, responding quickly to, to Michael, there are people who've held that we don't even have that. Right? Uh, I also think <coughs> those are the... So you might think of Kuhn at his most hysterical, right? as holding a, a view like that. Uh, and... <coughs> That, I think, is implausible, and I think it's rightly regarded as implausible by most people who are really genuinely moved by the history of science to be concerned about, right? This, the stuff about Kuhn loss, right, and by implication, the stuff you're suggesting about not being able to explain why past theories were successful when they were, uh, but assuming the, the truth of contemporary theoretical orthodoxy, those were always the least plausible parts of that crazy, uh, historical story, and I think they're uh, rightly left behind. Right. But you're right, people have said that. Michael, would you? Yeah, I, mean, I, I Starting with that point about Putnam, um, the point I had in mind was just that, that the realist Putnam was the same person who wrote Ain't Necessarily True, who defended quantum logic, who you know just loved scientific revolutions above all else, and he thought that was totally good for his, for his version of realism. Uh, so, and he would be unhappy with someone like Quine, who seems conservative. Another example of an instrumentalist I would take it would be von Frossen, and one of his main motives to, is to not make, take such epistemic risks. If you just accept a theory rather than believing the theory, you're not as likely to be wrong, and you're confining yourself to, to phenomena in a, in a narrow sense. Um, and with respect to, to Howard, I would, it's quite obvious his hero is Newton, who says that um, we just take the theory to be true until such time as we need to make changes which might involve radically changing the theory, perhaps even the geometry, perhaps even the laws of motion. And I would think his view would also be uh, we can't anticipate how it's going to go, but we can have something that's good and that will lead us to limits. <laughs> And that, that's what a good theory does. It leads us to the right limits. We don't know what will happen when we get there, but we at least have a good way to find them. Uh, so, so two, at least two things. Um, one is, this is part of why, so the, the example you used it in the early part of those remarks, uh, this is part of why it really matters uh, that I'm going to be talking about historically motivated instrumentalists. Because von Frossen's motivations are completely different and actually recommend a, quite a different kind of, uh, uh, of instrumentalism for just the reasons you point out. What he's really doing is looking to uh, uh, take as few epistemic risks as we possibly can while still getting all the benefits we can get out of, out of science. And uh, that's why, so I don't think that, so the stuff about uh, what the future of science is going to look like, right? That doesn't apply to Montrossen. Uh, he 
maybe in an implausibly realist way, thinks that the empirical adequacy of our theories is empirical adequacy forever, too. Right? So, so I do, in that way, I'm happy to restrict my discussion to a certain kind of, of instrumentalist. Um, but is Loudon's paradigm effective? Who is the paradigm I think Loudon's paradigm uh, there he, he made it more radical. Yeah, so I don't think he should have made that claim. It's right? a pessimistic meta Well, that's not actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what Loudon does. <laughs> Loudon argues against. Uh, a certain explanatory uh, commitment of realists, but but yeah, that's the that's the right uh, uh, ballpark of, of instrumentalism that I've got in mind. Um, now you have to remind me of the second, just uh, the second set of or Those part of the work. Oh yes, and I think what Howard has in mind is there yeah. are these structures, but they're always going to be transformed in ways that you can't anticipate. And I think he takes Newton to be very plausibly having such a view. So that strikes me as a plausible very plausible view of Newton, and I think you're almost certainly right that that aspect of Newton in particular is something that Howard's very sympathetic to. And in that case, right, the point here is just, it's bad to describe that attitude as uh, the kind of uh, seamless middle ground that emerges when you enlighten or sophisticate realism as well as, as instrumentalism. Uh, if the, right, so I guess I'm, I'm tempted to go back to the whoever denied, right, uh, that there were going to be important continuities uh, as well as discontinuities between present and future signs, right? Well, sorry, yeah, Loudon in some hysterical <laughs> moments denied exactly that. <laughs> but, um, right, no one should deny that. And in that case, I mean, it seems to me that the the claim that we're rescuing realism too uh, is something of a fig leaf, right? It, it makes us feel uh, more secure that we've we've satisfied that impulse. Uh, but if if what that impulse comes to in the end is there will be continuities between contemporary and future science, and they will be deep and important, but they're completely unpredictable. Uh, I don't see that we've actually. Uh, retained what motivated realists in the first place? Look, I think the, what you're, what I want to claim you're missing about the realist is the aspect of in trying to empirically determine or get empirical evidence about theoretical pieces and uh, using empirical uh, investigations to establish the acceptability of theoretical terms now and distinguishing among those. And, and the point about when, when Eric brought up that in, in physics you've got the quantum mechanical realm and, 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 and GR and different, a big part of, a, a really important part is the openness of all this because there isn't one theory. And, and a big part of what theoretical, uh, of, of, is this idea of looking for ways to get em empirical uh, guidance on how to make the changes that we know we're going to have to do. And you've just left that out. And that makes, you, that means your, minute, your, your view of what it is to be a realist and how it has to connect with empiricism is just about as bad as that president on that aircraft oh. <laughs> That's tough. That's tough. Uh, <laughs> that's tough. Oh, I, I just forgot everything else you said. <laughs> no, uh, look, <clears throat> in a way, I suppose I didn't make this clear structurally in my initiative. In a way, what I'm worried about here, uh, so many, many of the individual things about uh, what Howard or any reasonable person ought to think uh, about how this works seem to me entirely well taken. What I'm worried about is that Howard can't have everything he wants that he expresses the desire for, right, in this, uh, in this uh, paper. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's quite right that the, um, right, the important part of the story here is getting the world to bear on, differentially, right, on different parts of 
theoretical um, uh, of our existing theoretical apparatus. But once we've done that, right, uh, in the scarce investment of scarce resources way, we're not really methodological omnivores anymore. I, no, I, that's I not true. I can't, yeah, this yeah. is just, you once we've done that, that, that just, <laughs> this is the point. It's an ongoing thing. There isn't a once we've done it. No, we have, our resources are scarce at every point oh. along the way. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was, I was, as, I, my question is related to these questions. Uh, and it has to do with, I'm not, completely sure there is this relation between the realist and conservatism regarding theories or the instrumentalist and revolutions or inclinations to more revolutions. And for one part, we could see examples in the history of science in which people who were instrumentalists were blocking. Take the Copenhagen, take some people from the Copenhagen interpretation, for example, some people who didn't let others like bomb or other physicists like develop their theories. And, and they had a very pragmatic or instrumentalist attitude that of course it would be a naive instrumentalism, I guess you could mm -hmm. say that. But yeah, so I was wondering if you go to cases in science, I would like to see if there is this relation between a scientist who is inclined as a realist to be more conservative or not. And I don't know if that you have that. And if it is about philosophers, then that makes no difference because what we take realism or instrumentalism to be, like that's not like conducting research in science. So, so uh, there is that. Too. So, so good point. That that ties uh, that that makes uh, realist or instrumentalist commitments, I think, a little too much a matter of the the sort of personality or character, the psychological character of scientists. That's not um, really what I mean. The uh, the, but it's it's not a. I don't. It seems to me not not good to sort of split up into. Well, is it going to make a difference if you're a scientist? Is it going to make a difference if you're if you're a philosopher? Um, I'm suspicious of the ability to 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 do that to draw that anyway. Um, but it seems to me. And look, uh, I, instrumentalism more broadly, I think, is not a view about theories or theoretical knowledge. Uh, real, scientific realists are instrumentalists about Newtonian mechanics. Right? Uh, realism, uh, I won't say why, but realism and instrumentalism are attitudes that everybody needs. The difference is what particular bodies of claims or theories you're prepared to take an instrumentalist attitude towards. And the, su the suggestion is, right, if you're taking a realist attitude towards some part of it, right, then what you're expecting is that's not going to get overturned. Right? And so I wouldn't, uh, I would say that level of grain, let's go find some realist scientists and see if they, you know, really act in the way that we're saying or not, right? Um, there's a way in which that's a mistake. Everybody is a realist about some things and an instrumentalist about other things. And the, the fine grained question would be, right, um, do those expectations about what the future inquiry will be like uh, track the, the uh, permissive dispos disposition to, uh, to explore widely, more widely rather than more narrowly and stuff like that? Well, we're almost out of time, but I, I have Wayne and Jim next. Okay. Uh, if you guys yeah. round us so, up, we have a So on this issue about whether we can prospectively identify the sorts of things that we sh think should be preserved, there's something that's conspicuously missing from your discussion. Um, so when I think about what parts of theory we should um, re re regard to be conserved, I ask myself, well, what parts do we have really good evidence for, and which parts are more risky extrapolations? So I do think you know, you're taking Howard to task for thinking that it's established beyond a doubt that ordinary uh, bodies extend can the momentum of the ether. I think we have very good evidence of that. You can measure light pressure on ordinary bodies. Um, well, you're a realist. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but, do you, but, well, I don't know if I'm a realist or not, but I think we have good evidence for that. Mm -hmm. um, we have very good evidence that TR is a very good approximation of solar system distances. Uh, or, so we have solar system, solar system phenomena. 
most people think it breaks down for very right for, for very high gravitational fields. Um, the extrapolation it needed to infer the existence of, gra of, 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 of dark, dark matter on the basis of general relativity is, I think, right, rightly regarded by everybody as a maybe warranted but riskier extrapolation, which means that we, because there are people who are exploring these things. And I think that we can make those judgments. And we can also make those judgments about the, the work of past scientists. Right? So if I'm looking at Lavoisier, I think he made a very good case that, for the case of mercury, oxygen is combined with this. The extrapolation to other uh, uh, um, instances of combustion and oxidation was a ri I, you know, what, what, what was a risk, ri risky, riskier extrapolation, and I say that even though I know it's been borne out. The acid theory. If you read what he says in the in the in the elements uh, of chemistry, he gives you three examples uh, of uh, of acids that are formed by oxygen mutation, and then extrapolates. We we not only in retrospect can make the judgment that that was a risky extrapolation, but people did at the time. Um, so yeah, so is it not true? That evidence bears, that bears differentially on, on parts of theory, and in some cases we can have very good reason to think the evidence is good enough. Oh, so yes or that? You know, is it in, do you agree that it is established beyond a reasonable doubt that ordinary bodies are changing momentum of the ether? No. Um, <laughs> in part because of everything that's presupposed by that claim, right? I mean, in a way, this is connected to the point. You're so I, I go in the yeah, lab and, 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 and I can um, shine a light on a um, reflective surface and me measure the light pressure of, of, of that of, 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 on that surface, and you don't take that as evidence. That but what we say about past science isn't everything anybody ever said involving the word caloric or phlogiston was false. You say that, that wasn't the best way to think about it, right? The reason I'm hesitating to commit to this is I don't have full confidence that we're going to look back and say, oh yeah, the electromagnetic field, uh, exchanges of momentum, that was the right way to think about it. Um, so more generally, right, I think it's perfectly plausible to advance the view that uh, evidence bears differently Right? We have stronger evidence for some kinds of cl some claims than others. I actually think that difference tracks most closely the types of evidence we have in particular kinds of cases. I think that when we should be uh, when we should take this this uh, adopt a realist attitude or an instrumentalist attitude towards some particular uh, scientific claim has to do with what what type of evidence that we we have for that claim, right? But but the point is this, right? Um, so I, I agree with you. I think we can distinguish among cases and say, look, uh, this I'm pretty confident in. This, I think, is more hypothetical or speculative. And this is clearly something that Howard finds admirable about Newton, right? Um, two things, right? One is, if we do that, I think the thing to recognize is we're no longer really methodological omnivores. Um, but maybe more importantly, there's something in the background here that I, I didn't say, but that matters to this picture. And that is, uh, we have been wrong over and over and over again in our claims about which things really were uh, is positively confirmed and were going to last, like, last forever. So there's, uh, right, the, the, there's a series. So what, I, what do I do to prove that to you? I give you three examples. I'm not going to do it, right? But I have three, three examples of scientists. Lavoisier is one, right? Who clearly says, well, look, I don't know about any of that, right? But this part's got to be right. And that part didn't turn out to be right. Well, when and so I'm very... What did you talking about with Lavoisier? Uh, the existence of the chloric fluid. And I, and I quoted, he said he called the hypothetical. He did, and that was itself. Right, right, so we, we need to stop. Okay, sorry.
Yeah, I apologize to Jim in this half of the room, so I'll emphasize him in the next talk. But uh, I guess we'll all like to thank Kyle for a really fun talk. Thank all the three of us will say collectively, bring it on! <laughs>